to introduce Mr. Brian Coble. He's Managing Director of Capital Markets and Healthcare <coughs> at the Albert Lee Group. So welcome. Thanks. I'm going to stand here because I am by far the least qualified to be here. So here we go. Um, thanks, Megan, for having me. Uh, and thank you, Dean, for kicking it off and putting me in such a tough bind by following somebody like that. Uh, <laughs> so in the interest of sticking with the Jerry Maguire theme uh, of showing the money, you can consider us the Rod Tidwell quote of the Ambassador to Juan relative to the family offices. Uh, the Alverlean Fund, our firm, is a multifamily office platform. We service uh, about 32 families, Asia and the US, all in the sub $100 million range. Uh, we look to provide them with high quality proprietary products. A lot of that is in healthcare, especially when it talks about co investments. Uh, and we offer the opportunity to connect with other family offices, either as syndicate or for their existing investments, as they pursue <coughs> future funding opportunities. Uh, we've been doing this about a decade or so now. Um, we've closed uh, in the last, call it, 12 to 18 months. We've done about six transactions in healthcare, uh, four of which are in the drug development space. Um, so looking at how we see the healthcare space, this is how we break down a relatively large vertical, just so you guys kind of have an idea of how we operate. We understand these three buckets are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but we do feel the segments carry similarities in regards to the FDA regulatory pathways, the end users of the markets, and the valuation metrics by which these companies get judged. Uh, as you all know, the regulatory pathway is extremely unpredictable. Uh, and obviously that statement applies to quality, by the way. Uh, but the FDA has made strides to be more amenable and more consistent, and that's sort of where we start our view of companies. Uh, and we think that given the transparency the FDA has approached people with as of late, we can get comfortable with an educated guess relative to ex expediting that pathway. And when we look at drug development specifically, which is sort of where I think a lot of you sort of sit, the last thing that we ever want to be is the smartest person in the room, and frankly, the last thing we ever are is the smartest person in the room. So we prefer people like Dean to be running that sort of dynamic for us. We try to align our goals heavily as family offices with the institutional partnerships. That can mean a lot of different things. It can mean corporates, it can mean venture capitalists. There's a whole host of people in that realm, um, and we'll get to that more later as to why we operate that way. So obviously when you look at the FDA pathway, this is all very well known to everybody in this room, so I'm not going to sort of break down the definitions for you and uh, waste your time. But I think the point we're trying to make here in regards to the FDA EMA is that as we make these educated guesses, uh, we have a better than chance of an expedited designation. And in that regard, it's a risk factor, right? So when we look at sort of risk across the board in drug development, the regulatory risk is extremely high relative to getting through the clinic. Um, having an expedited pathway, understanding <coughs> how fast and how cheap, is a huge benefit to investors and to companies. It allows you to pivot quicker, it allows you to be more efficient with capital. So when we look at risk, the FDA risk is one that we think we can actually control. Not that I think we're very good at it, but we can certainly control it. Um, and since you're all here because you need capital today, tomorrow, or like the vast majority of the companies we speak with yesterday, um, we recognize how expensive and complicated the drug development paradigm is. So you must be extremely efficient with your capital. And that's something that we think we can help companies drive through from a family office perspective, given we partner ourselves correctly and the family offices tend to be patient with their capital and more willing to re-up, I think, in a more that a drastic scenario. <clears throat> so we spend a lot of time with companies such as yourselves running through models and running through worst case scenarios and talking about where you need to fund yourself through. Um, so when we look at access to capital and family offices, <coughs> one of the things that I think people approach families incorrectly with on a senior or early stage investment is we're preclinical, we just want a little bit of capital, half a million right now, run a couple of mouse models, and then we'll go out to the larger VCs for larger capital. That tends to be a very tough dynamic from our perspective that we're comfortable with. We prefer to see funding that takes you through uh, a human trial, some type of phase one, 
There's a host of reasons for that, the most important being mouse to human, as everyone knows, is an extremely dynamic transition. But also, more often than not, there's a need for a pivot, and there are going to be stumbles. And in that scenario, you'd rather have more capital than less. So everyone loves a good heat map. And given I had to you know, show that I did some research, here's a heat map for you. Um, <laughs> So what this slide really boils down to sort of backs up our, our general thesis in regards to institutional investment, right? If you look at, and I'm not going to use the pointer because I'll screw it up, but you need a lot of deep pockets, right, to get through the clinical development pathway. If you take a wrong tact or a focus or you overspend in a dynamic that you shouldn't be, and where there isn't value in the end game, meaning value that institutional capital will actually take, it can be catastrophic, and your balance sheet can be irreparably harmed, basically, at that point. So when you look at series C, series A, sizes, and valuations, it's something that you need to take into account as you take additional capital, where institutional, institutional capital is actually interested in seeing value, right? So if you're investing or putting capital to work in a space that doesn't have interest in the institutional end, you're going to end up carrying the bag of capital for a very, very long period of time. Specific to family offices, you know, they tend to be intelligent investors, they tend to be generally patient, but they tend to not have in-house expertise uh, in regards to healthcare and drug development. It's extensive, it's a complicated, and one of the biggest issues that we face is setting valuation, where family offices are extremely reluctant to do that. Um, we prefer that to be set by an institution who understands the space deeper than we will, and certainly can look at the next several rounds and make some type of a justification around that valuation metric. Um, Europe is actually, for those of you who are there, if you've ever been or looked at investing in Europe, it's sort of an interesting dynamic to see how family offices and high net worth individuals as investors can create a negative dynamic for companies when they invest early stage. A lot of early stage European companies for years have been taking capital from family offices. It's a relatively well-known space over there and high net worth individuals, and also grants. Um, but you see valuations over there extremely inflated, which leads to the inevitable down round, and inevitably uh, leads to consternation and difficulty with your existing shareholder bases. When we partner our venture firms with family offices, we tend to get the best of both worlds. You get patient capital, you get understanding capital, you get family offices out there speaking at cocktail parties to their other investors, that capital tends to flow in rapidly. Well, the venture capital firms can set the valuation for us and give us comfort in the long run that those deep pockets will continue to be there and continue to fund the company as it moves forward. One of the things that I think Dean actually mentioned was um, sort of some of this, right? Which is what we're sort of referring to as a collision course. So, not specific to Philadelphia, but specific broadly, um, you've seen a significant amount of capital flow into venture capital firms um, themselves in the billions and billions of dollars over the last 24 to 36 months. You've seen seed stage size capital <coughs> increase roughly to $2 million from somewhere in the range of 500,000. And you've seen commensurately Series A can continue to increase from a dollar size perspective. Um, one of the reasons for that, or one of the very many reasons for that, is as tons of capital flows into the VC community, you are seeing them move farther and farther downstream and put capital to work earlier and earlier and earlier. Everybody knows Atlas, Flagship, New Path, all these firms are now going into actually company creation or seed level investing. Novo Seeds is another <coughs> good example. That is giving both a positive and negative to companies, right? One, understanding that the reason people come to family offices is to not be beholden to venture capital firms. Um, we recognize that as a necessity. Um, certainly, we want to be friendly. Um, but we also recognize that we can't compete on a dollar basis, either in a seed round or in future funding rounds with the venture capital community. So from a preclinical basis and from an early seed stage basis, um, partnering ourselves with deep pockets that have significant capital and can continue to fund you through stumbles or whatever else, uh, as a firm, we see that as a strong paradigm for family offices. They can be the first capital in, in some ways, um, but the need for venture capital to backstop those, those funds from a seed perspective uh, in early stage VC is a necessity for our family offices. And some of that, if you look at sort of 
R&D costs, which Dean mentioned here, depending on who you talk to. Um, you can be in for 25 to 50 million in five years before you ever get, get a real clinical event. Um, that's a lot of capital from a family office perspective, right? Especially the sub-100 million. But even when you start talking to the billions into an individual company, uh, that is significant capital. So not having an expert in the room, not having someone who's been through these fires before and understands um, how to pursue the next step and pivot and everything else can be a little bit dynamic for a, a family office to try and handle. I think a lot of people tend to view um, family offices and seed funding and biotech as dumb money, uh, which is certainly fair in many degrees. Um, I would agree with them from my perspective at least, uh, but I can't speak for other people. And it is friendly capital, but I think when you're pursuing families from a capital raise perspective, you should sort of view it like an airplane. So as somebody who's afraid of flying, I will tell you how that works. Um, <coughs> you view yourself as the pilot and you're going to these family offices and you're in control of this plane. You should view them as passengers more than you should co-pilots or navigators. And in that regard, you need a co-pilot or a navigator who gives them comfort and makes them less skittish. Um, you are going to hit turbulence as a pilot. You are going to be off course and have to turn and avoid storms and all these other things and probably end up in a storm at some point. Having a navigator from a venture capital community who can calm the skittish investors and give those family office passengers a little bit of comfort that the plane is not going to crash or that you've recourse to the appropriate airport, for example, um, when you pivot is a huge step in benefiting not only yourselves having to deal with any number of shareholder issues as you pursue additional funding, um, whether it's a down round or whether it means getting to understand, hey look, this next round of capital is coming from somebody who is more valuable than you and needs to take your board seat or however you view that. You need that adult in the room who's outside of you, who they view as not drinking the necessarily the Kool-Aid as an internal CEO would or CSO would, and that outside voice can calm them and bring them back to sort of what we would call reality of the situation. So, this is how we've sort of looked at the impact healthcare investor paradigm, right? Which is sort of unique. In literally every other investing vertical, as you de-risk an asset, your valuation increases in time, right? In healthcare, thankfully, as your risk increases, your valuation increases. That's a very odd dynamic when you think about it, right? Your level, if you get through a phase one clinic, it's like 80%, something like that. Phase two is 37 or 40%, and phase three is something like 25%, depending on who you talk to, if you can have the PLA and some other things. In those scenarios, you're talking about ever-increasing valuation stages, right? As a family office, one, you really can't participate in the, in the additional funding rounds as you start getting into those Series A, really Series B type dynamics. It's very hard if you start as a seed investor to match yourself from an LP perspective all the way through those dynamics. So either we have to come in and pay up at a Series B level with some of our institutional uh, partners who we're fine with. We have to find extremely unique opportunities that have a few of the boxes checked that we look at. Uh, where we can partner these in institutions and bring our family offices, or we have to go super early stage. For us to get comfortable with an early stage investment <clears throat> takes quite some time. So when you start talking about when should you approach family offices, <coughs> it's pretty much immediate, right? Your conversations with VCs that take six, nine, 12 months, so Nova once told me that it's a nine month process. I don't know a whole lot of early stage companies that can last nine months without capital, but I think that's kind of funny. Um, they should be starting at the same time as family offices. We can move a little bit quicker, that's for sure. But at the same time, we're not the, the check you're getting in the first 30, 45, 60 days. It's gonna be equally difficult to get that capital out of us and having some type of an institution who at least we can talk to and bounce the idea off and get comfortable with will benefit you in the long run. So if we know you're having conversations with institutions and we also know you're talking to us and we know things are going well, we can get ourselves over the hump. And to that dynamic, um, we launched a transaction um, in August with one of our family offices, <coughs> excuse me, called Project Pac-Man, um, mainly because it actually is a Gamma Delta T company. It looks like a Pac-Man logo eating it, so it's kind of fun if you ever see it. Um, it is a cell therapy company. It's based out of Europe. 
um, specifically in the gamma delta T space, uh, focusing on allogeneic cell therapy platforms. Um, right now, they're in clinical phase one slash two for AML. But at the time, they had human data in autologous. We actually had early stage in their first cohort for AML data on the human side. They're actually the only gamma delta T cell allogeneic company we know of with human data. Happy to be told I'm wrong, as I usually am. Um, we've known the CEO and the COO for about five years. They've been in cell therapy for over 40 years. One of them is the mother of Dolly the Sheep. Um, so we knew we had an expert management team. And we went out and we got uh, institutional validation from a number of groups that we work with early on before our families invested. So that process gave us comfort to be able to come in. Uh, the initial investment was about $4 million at the end of August, or sorry, end of October. We will put an additional probably three to four million on the balance sheet before the end of the year uh, with the institutional VC round coming probably sometime in February will be the close. So that's a really good dynamic for you to put into your mindset when you look at how families are going to invest, right? We've had the institutional conversations in August with some of the families. Also, we were able to put the capital in in October having had those conversations back and forth with the VC community, understanding that their process of validation is going to take a little bit longer, but also being able to get comfortable that there's enough smoke here that we believe there's fire, right? So whether our capital works today <coughs> or whether that, that VC round comes in some time Q2, we at least understand that one, we have a relatively safe valuation. We haven't gone completely off the reservation with it. We're not in the billion dollars, right? It's about a 120 million valuation, free money. <coughs> and two, we understand that the venture capital community will be there at some point in the next 90 to 180 days to be supportive of the company to take that burden of capital off of the family offices and hand it on to somebody with deeper pockets, more expertise that can take a real operational role, um, which I think is a point that, that Dean sort of referenced in regards to regionality of venture capital. Capital is certainly portable, but from a family office perspective, you know, while we enjoy the board seat and we think it's a lot of fun to go and listen to everybody talk and raise our hand for votes and things like that and be a board observer, we're probably not the ideal person to be driving board decisions when it comes to drug development, right? Um, you need that institutional investor, that person with a degree, the person who's seen 100 companies make mistakes and has learned from that process to help drive you. That, that you need that role of some type of a an adult room's not the right phrase because everybody in this room is an adult, certainly. Um, but someone you can bounce ideas off of, somebody you can have a frank discussion with, who can give you the black and white conversation. And family offices, not that we aren't educated and don't believe that we know what we're talking about, but certainly in regards to drug development, we are not. Um, so I would say that when you talk about how to approach family offices, how early is too early, when do you want to put that capital to work, um, there's any number of families that invest for a whole lot of reasons, both qualitative and quantitative. They invest early, they invest late, they invest across the board. Um, but the approach to them should be not as, hey, give me half a million dollars, your son was sick, or hey, give me $50,000, I want to run a seed trial, and all these other things. It should be with a fully built out package, the same way you would approach the institutions, just to press them a little bit faster, right? So if you do both at the same time, you'll have a much higher result, or a much higher likelihood of a positive result, then you will just going out to families, try to raise a little bit of money, and kick that can down the road. Um, Dean's point about always raising capital is one well taken, um, and one of the ways to try and get yourself out of that paradigm of feeling like you're constantly raising capital every six months or so, um, and really trying to push valuation bumps, which is a very tough dynamic, is to take in larger capital, um, push yourself out to a more of an inflection point, where you actually see a valuation jump are significant, which is probably why you see a lot of large venture capital rounds coming in, not just the capital coming into venture, but the fact that they've been able to fund themselves much longer, so they go from a $50 million valuation to a $5 billion valuation based off of their use of capital and being efficient. Um, that is pretty much my, my spiel. I have way fewer slides than Dean, because I have way less work. Um, he's much smarter than I am. So, <laughs> um, happy to have any questions if anybody's got any. Um, I'm here to answer them. Please.
funds are unwilling to do navigation, uh, yes. so I'll take the lead. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so you're left with, uh, are you open for a convertible next then? So yeah, the majority of what we do, if it's a, if we don't set valuation, it's usually a convertible based off of the next round and or lower of. Um, but typically that bridge type scenario, uh, I would say is something we try and avoid um, relative to setting valuation. There's, there's certainly reasons why, why you have to end up there and you say, all right, we'll put in a little bit of money now, a million dollars as your, let's call it series B1. Series A1, C1, uh, based off of a 20% valuation drop on the next capital in, or the lower of X valuation, right? And in that dynamic, we're more than willing to have the conversation with the next round or the next investor who comes in if it's a professional investor, an institutional investor who says, look, the valuation's X and you're not going to get discount. That's not necessarily something that we're against, right? It's more the concern around a non-institutional investor trying to set a valuation around that we're not comfortable with. At that point, it gives us a little bit of leverage, frankly. Um, so the answer is yes, we do convertible equity type things. It's less debt, more preferred. Um, you know, there's no reason to sort of complicate the cap stack um, from our perspective. Mike, excuse me, it, it sounds like you need somebody with an expertise on early investments that prefers to invest with convertible notes and maybe has a track record of returning good capital investment on that that you can co-invest with. And I think the Comey Fox found one. Let me introduce you to Ben Franklin Technology Partners. <laughs> <laughs> they do more investments in early stage and they do more deal uh, structure. It sounds like a perfect match. So I'm, I'm just trying to be the, uh, uh, the Yenta here. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you like. No, but I, 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 no, I'm, 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 I'm serious. It sounds well, like be the Sherpa. I would I prefer that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm fine with that. Um, no, but it, it just sounds like I, I, I was just amazed that when you were saying how you like to invest or whatever it is, co-investing and creating a, a co-investment partnership, at least in a small one with Ben Franklin, seems to be unique. I, I, the county of Bucks has no ability to do evaluation, but they've done very well. I personally have written them a check for $250,000 and they've got that and they got a piece of my company. So they're, they're ecstatic. They created you know 30 jobs in Bucks County. That, that's less of your concern, but uh, you know there, there's a way in which to tap into something that's doing all the thing. That's yeah, we, we'd love that. I, you know, we, we certainly look to partner with any number of groups. I think one of the slides <laughs> reference the institutional groups we partnered with, and we've right. gone across the board with anybody, and frankly, we prefer less known emerging managers anyway, because they tend to be hungrier, and frankly, they outperform their peers by a pretty significant margin, uh, unless you're benchmark, and then nobody outperforms you. One more question. Uh, pac man project, if that's indicative of the types of deals that you do, it seems, in all honesty, that uh, the family uh, investment groups are risk adverse at best. I mean, you look at what you identify as the resources in that particular company that you invested in, in I think you said uh, the UK. Yep. I mean, people would kill to have that kind of uh, assets in a company. It's true. There's very, I believe my perception is there's extremely little risk <coughs> in that investment. So are you willing to take less of a return because of the risk factor or I mean, do you expect I, the same return? The first thing I would say is I think every investor is risk averse. Right? There's no such thing as an investor who's not risk averse. That's sort of the first thing that investors look at. Um, but I would say that, specifically to Project Pac-Man, it's just because we're really good at what we do, not good. Uh, we, uh, it was a little bit of luck, right? It checked all the boxes, right? And we sort of ended up there because similar to sort of what you've created here to some degree in other groups, um, they've been funded by a group out of Scotland and some high net worth individuals who is Scottish investment bank money. Um, they were extremely efficient with the capital. And there are certainly risks involved here, right? It's unmodified gamma of the T cells, so there's no real IP around that. There's some manufacturing IP and some know-how, right? But unless you go up in drug status, you can't really protect it. Um, but what I would say is we're not risk averse, 
we're averse to risk we can't control, and or at least or at least quantify, right? And um, there's, there's a guy if you guys have, are looking at venture capital groups, you should look at Vickers, super interesting guys, guy Finney and Tan. Um, and I had a chat with him the other day, and he was saying that the way they view risk is unique, and it's led to extremely high returns since about 2013, huge jump. And he said, well, what do you mean? He said, look, there's sort of three buckets of risk that venture capitals typically look at. Technology risk, does it work? We can get comfortable with that, I can quantify that risk. IP risk, does somebody else do this, can they do it? If they do, are they violating patents or whatever else? How protected are you? How, what's your moat like, right? Product risk. Can somebody buy, will somebody buy this if I make it? And he said, in 2013, we stepped back and looked and said, that's an unquantifiable risk. I don't know that I can sell product XYZ. I don't know that my social media site will drive people or whatever else it is. So let's try and do risk and get rid of that entirely and just look at these two buckets here, IP and technology. What I took away from that not is that we don't look at product risk, but more when you quantify a risk, you're always going to have a certain level of it. It's just what's acceptable to you. Um, so there's certainly risk here, right? The, the data early in AML is in three patients. The next three could be completely disastrous, and we're dead in the water, and we've got to refocus on the next pipeline, right? Which is why you always want to try to have multiple shots on goal. Um, if we could be beat to market by Addison or somebody like that. There's a whole host of things that could occur. But the risks that we can quantify, we can get comfortable with. So I don't know that we're risk averse so much as we are averse to uncontrollable risk or unquantifiable risk. Okay. All right, well, big thank you to Brian. Thank you.